Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Intelligent Logistics, a position imaging podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B. And folks, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of the show. We appreciate you tapping into more conversations from the larger logistics industry as we explore key technologies and trends that are changing the way we send and receive uh, packages, parcels, and uh, really how major companies and different touch points across the supply chain play an ever-evolving role in meeting these evolving demands. So again, I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B. Thanks so much for joining us. And before we jump into today's conversation, I want to make sure that you've got all of our previous conversations handy and that you're tapped into our thought leadership. So make sure that you're heading to our website, positionimaging.com. Again, position-imaging.com. And you can also subscribe to Intelligent Logistics on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Just hit that subscribe button and you'll have a full catalog of previous conversations plus notifications when we drop new ones. So team, let's go ahead and jump into our conversation for the day. Our collective logistics world is still grappling with the mass adoption and normalization of delivery efficiencies over the last two years. Everything uh, from BOPIS to curbside pickup to ever faster expectations around delivery times just in general. And though these pickup and delivery options have proven valuable to meet the demands of an omni-channel consumer, with these methods also comes a refocus on some of the inefficiencies of last mile logistics, a very key element of the puzzle. Lost or stolen packages, uh, difficulties navigating both urban and rural environments, different challenges but similarly disruptive, uh, and just increased fulfillment needs at large are all requiring a thoughtful last mile strategy that takes into account the individual needs of the retailer, big or small, uh, but also is responsive, right? A strategy that is responsive to the community that it's serving. And this is where our main topic of the conversation enters the scene, PUDO, right? Pick up, drop off options. And this is one of the more successful attempts to bridge the world of local brick and mortar as well as online order fulfillment. So with today's podcast, what we're wanting to do is get a deep dive into this rising trend of pickup drop-off, how it's working to solve last mile inefficiencies uh, by tapping into local communities and their retail presence, and how it compares to some other last mile strategies, uh, and really try to do a little compare and contrast, weigh the options. What is the best holistic strategy and what role will pick up drop off play in that larger ecosystem? So here to give us some perspective and pulling from his experience with UPS as their U.S. network manager for its uh, access point network. He was part of the delivery network operations team there. I'm pleased to welcome from the position imaging team, Mr. Dan O'Connor, vice president of pickup and delivery options. Dan, great to have you on. How are you doing? Thanks, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Got to love having two Dans on the podcast, <laughs> chatting uh, some some very timely topics. And yes, again, I appreciate you taking some time out of your holiday season to discuss this important and timely trend. Um, so before we jump into our core conversation, can you give our audience a little bit of context to your career background? Uh, obviously, include your position imaging work, but also uh, some of your work at UPS and how that informs your perspective today. Well, I had uh, 30, more than 30 years with UPS, Dan, and did virtually every job you can do at UPS except for fly the plane. Um, I was a, a driver. Um, I was supervised drivers. I worked in industrial engineering. Um, I worked in marketing. Uh, and I eventually moved into new product development where um, I came across the pickup and delivery options program. So in 2011, UPS, uh, in support of its operations in Europe, acquired a company called Kiala. And they were a pickup and delivery option company that services lots of carriers uh, in lots of countries in Europe. Um, UPS, like it normally does, once it makes an acquisition, uh, looks for other ways to leverage those technologies. And that's how the project ended up in new product development, where we started the UPS Access Point Network in 2014. It was initially designed to support uh, consumers who have problems receiving packages at home, like perhaps a signature is required and they're not there. 
Um, but as time went on, the offering expanded to include um, many more use cases beyond just the missed delivery attempts. And just for a little bit more context, uh, was UPS one of the first players to launch an at scale pickup drop off ecosystem? Uh, give us the timeline there. Yeah, I, I think that's true in the US. Um, the pickup and delivery uh, shops have been active in Europe for as long as there's been e-commerce. Um, but it was in uh, 2013 that we first, that UPS first started uh, deploying its program. Um, we had built up a network of 5,000 independent locations uh, in urban and super urban environments, primarily to address those missed delivery attempts that I mentioned a minute ago. Um, and then a kind of an inflection point came in 2018 when uh, FedEx entered the market with their partnership with Walgreens and UPS partnered with CVS and Michael stores. So you, you had an overnight doubling of the Pudo, of the scale of Pudo in, in the U.S. And we'll get into some of those more recent trends here as well uh, that have been motivating this push for Pudo. But yeah, thank you again for that context. I think uh, obviously your work at UPS is going to help draw a lot of parallels to some of Position Imaging's work in this space and also where you see the larger Pudo network going moving forward. So let's jump into some of those trends. Some of them are market motivated. Some of them are consumer motivated. So let's start with the consumer trends. How do you see consumer habits, um, some of the domino effects that come from omni-channel consumer demand leading to a more recent rise in pickup drop-off options? Well, I, I think that the demand for drop-off is primarily being driven by returns. And so as e-commerce mm -hmm. uh, business continues to grow and the outbound volumes continue to grow, um, there's going to naturally be an increase in return volume. And the carriers need to make it easy for people to access their networks. And the best way to do that is by providing lots of pickup and drop off alternatives. So the need for the network is driven at first by the consumer's need to return packages. I think what we're going to start to see um, more of in the near future is um, the need for pickup of packages away from homes because of the way that major carriers are pricing residential deliveries. You know, both carriers, uh, FedEx and UPS recently announced their 2022 rate increases and the cost for a residential package is approaching $5 more than the cost of a commercial package. So a retailer has a serious incentive to provide uh, the pickup option uh, at a commercial location. They can save a lot of money on shipping costs. So that's kind of the, the twist of the tail, I think. So what had started out primarily as a returns focus, I think is going to be evolving rapidly uh, into a way for retailers to continue to offer free or low price shipping um, by convincing the customers to pick up the package at the Pudo location. And how much would you say these trends are short-term responses to COVID supply chain disruptions or uh, general sort of consumer demand versus how much would you say that these trends are long-term resolutions to trends that we've seen in the works for years now, right? Weigh those two motivating factors. I, I think you're... you're... Second point is is the right one. Uh, this this mm. trend towards increasing pickup and delivery options has been underway for some time, uh, and I think it's been it had been steadily escalating. The demand for alternative delivery and pickup uh, had been growing steadily year over year. I think there was a slight setback uh, early on in the COVID pandemic when everyone was home. Uh, so there was no problems receiving their packages, but all indications are now that things are back to normal, that the, the growth in use of pickup and delivery options is, is growing again steadily. Um, so I think we've kind of uh, lapped the COVID pause. Now, beyond the consumer-led trends that are motivating the deployment of uh, Pudo locations and a Pudo ecosystem in the U.S., is there anything that 
isn't consumer led, right? Uh, some market motivators, general trends and shifts in how the market is responding to uh, changes in investment, changes in technology, uh, changes in some of their tangential related industries. Give us your perspective there. Well, I think the, the carriers have a, a singular interest in um, increasing the number of Pudo locations because they want to get out of the business of last mile delivery as much as possible. They would much mm -hmm. rather deliver 10 packages to a Pudo location than make 10 stops delivering one package each. I think that uh, also the interesting thing is the number of retailers who want to participate in Pudo networks. Retailers are really being motivated by the opportunity to capture additional foot traffic from people who are just coming into their stores um, to get a package. A great example of that would be the um, uh, Kroger grocery store chain, which has implemented uh, Puda locations in, in many parts of the country. And it, for them, it's just, it's all about the foot traffic. They want you to get you in the store. You're gonna get a gallon of milk along with picking up your package. Well, let's start to weigh some of the uh, impacts then of Pudo. How would you say these trends impact the retailers that are benefiting from the increased demand of e-commerce or the accelerated demand over the last two years, right? Uh, break down the impact there on the retailer and then where you see them struggling the most dependent on size, you know, big or small, to meet some of this omni-channel demand. So I think there's two things that are critical for retailers um, going forward. Um, and the first one is the cost of home delivery. Um, it just goes up and up and up uh, at an accelerating rate every year. So the ability to avoid the cost of a residential delivery is going to be key to retailers moving forward. In addition, what we've seen over the last couple of years is there's extremely tight capacity among the carriers around uh, peak season. So the carriers have implemented caps on the amount of residential volume that they will take from shippers, from retailers, large and small. And um, by shifting those packages into the Pudo network and creating commercial deliveries instead of residential deliveries, the shippers can avoid uh, the constraint on residential delivery times. The Pudo ecosystem has a lot of key players. Uh, we just laid out the impact on the, the brands themselves, right? That benefit from having an expanded um, logistics network for pickup and for delivery and order fulfillment. Now, what about for the brick and mortar locations themselves that sort of become the touch point, that become the Pudo location? What is the impact that uh, being a part of a Pudo ecosystem has had on those retail operations, those you know, main street brick and mortar operations that sure. now take on pickup, drop off, and logistics uh, responsibilities? Well, obviously there's a positive benefit. Um, if you operate your brick and mortar store as a Pudo location, you're going to see increased foot traffic and have opportunity for additional sales. Um, sure. That That's well, a lot of surveys have been done on that. I think that the general consensus is about one in three uh, Pudo users comes in and makes a, an additional purchase. So there's definitely an upside from a sales uh, and awareness perspective. I think that the challenge that a brick and mortar retailer faces when they become a Pudo operation is effectively managing the inventory of packages in the shop and providing a high quality customer experience to people who come in to pick up their package. You know, it requires a pretty high degree of organization uh, and some some good training of the staff uh, in, in order to provide the quality experience that the shippers want their customers to have when they pick up the package. And I'm curious how you see um, a Pudo ecosystem creating synergies, right? Because again, it takes a lot of different players to make Pudo work and sort of each player has to have a clear understanding of their responsibility in the ecosystem uh, and there has to be open communication as well between these brick and mortar touch points, some of the uh, e-commerce operations that they are taking on the responsibility of moving their parcel for. So break that down for us. How do you see Pudo creating these synergies? And is that intrinsic to the ecosystem or does there have to be another layer of 
communications work, of visibility work that needs to be added, you know, visibility technology as well to make sure things are efficient. Well, I think it's it's an interesting ecosystem in that uh, it's like a symbiotic relationship between the retailer, the carrier, and the e-commerce buyer. Uh, everybody benefits um, from the consumer's perspective. Uh, they have an opportunity to select a place where they can pick up the package at a time that's convenient for them with no risk of the package disappearing off the porch uh, and no hassle of trying to have, be there to have to meet the driver. So it's extremely convenient and secure for the consumer. From the carrier's perspective, um, it's a great way to uh, avoid putting undue burdens on their network during the busiest time of year. Uh, and it's, a, it's an opportunity for them to partner with some of their bigger customers who choose to become members of the Pudo network. And then finally, for the, for the hosts, for the retailers who are hosts in the Pudo network, who operate the shops for the carriers and consumers, they just have a, a, the upside benefit of increased foot traffic and the opportunity for more sales, uh, as well as, um, in many cases, uh, just being a good member of the community and providing a service for the people who live near them. And finally, the last benefit for the retailer is that it's a chance to essentially create a shadow fleet of shops where customers can pick up their packages. So if I'm a large department store retailer with uh, 1,300 shops around the country, uh, I might not have a shop within 20 miles of a customer, but there would be a Pudo location a mile away which would make it very easy for that person to take advantage of the alternate delivery arrangement. True, true. And uh, how do you see that also intersecting with um, some of these brick and mortar retailers' needs for uh, brick and mortar expansion, right? Uh, especially coming out of COVID, we saw a lot of department stores rethink how their physical footprint plays into their larger omni-channel strategy for sales, uh, you know, I'll throw Toys R Us out there, for example. A yeah. lot of their stores, you know, when they closed, um, there were a few more experimental stores that then reopened that were more focused on, let's have the kids play with the toys. The whole purpose of our store is not really to buy the product, but to test it out. And that's just a radical shift in yeah. what the brick and mortar touch point is supposed to be for the customer and in the larger sales journey. So, do you see Pudo playing a role in uh, these larger strategies as department stores or even small boutiques consider, you know, how do I expand my presence? Is it worth investing in a new brick and mortar location? Do they start to consider, hey, maybe I just invest online and roll with a Pudo partnership instead? What are you seeing there? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Dan. I mean, as every year goes by and the percentage of retail sales that are that are made online continues to increase. I believe it's going to be 20% next year. Um, you're having fewer and fewer dollars per square foot in a traditional brick and mortar environment. And those environments are struggling. Um, shopping malls are closing, losing their anchors. Um, so these places are becoming more and more difficult to maintain. Um, the, uh, the shops that do close often come back uh, with a smaller format, um, which creates challenges for inventory. So, you know, there's a desire to offer a full line of inventory, but you can't do that in a smaller shop. So you you have to have an online presence. Uh, and then once you get the order, uh, if you don't have the network, the fleet of stores that you once had, then the, I think the Pudo network is a great alternative to bring you close to your customer. And, you know, the thing that stands out to me personally the most about Pudo Networks is, uh, you know, it has to do with that point of the fact that it's partnerships with already existing brick and mortars. But I guess to take it one step further, it's the community aspect of it. The fact that because, uh, you know, whether it's a, a local boutique that wants to expand some of its uh, pickup and delivery touch points for its online base, or whether it's a massive multinational chain coming in and partnering with these smaller brick and mortar touch points across a community 
creates opportunities for, like you said, extra sales when in store, but also these revitalized touch points with consumers and between the business and its patrons. So I'm curious how you see that community aspect, the community domino effect being part of uh, the appeal behind a, a Pudo network. What is the net effect that you've seen yeah. you know, from that domino effect on communities where Pudo networks are launched? And how do you see that being you know, something to consider as a benefit uh, when launching this ecosystem? Well, one of the things that I found when I was um, recruiting locations to be access point locations for UPS was that I had very good success at small independent shops if there was a poster in the window advertising a local high school play or they're a supporter of the sports team um, because those kinds of individuals who are running those shops were extremely interested in being uh, well thought of in their community. They, they were easy to recruit and they stayed with the program for a long time. They, um, they got a lot of personal satisfaction out of being part of the Pudo network in addition to the financial benefits. I also want to make sure we highlight uh, the couriers in this uh, Pudo discussion. Regardless of if a Pudo strategy is launched or not, the last mile uh, delivery challenges that uh, you know take place today, a lot of that heavy lifting ends up falling on the efficiency of the couriers, their routes, delivery, and pickup load. And so I'm curious where in their duties do you see couriers stretched thin today? And how does Pudo intersect with those challenges and hopefully create some, um, you know, some chances to alleviate said challenges or at least create more efficiencies in those processes? Well, even though we know that e-commerce um, is growing as a percentage of retail sales and the number of packages goes up every year, there still is a challenge for carriers in terms of uh, driving delivery density. Uh, even though you know we're 20 years into e-commerce now, or perhaps even more, uh, and e-commerce is 20% of retail sales today, you still struggle to get uh, package densities above one per stop. And uh, you know the the courier's cost per stop is relatively high. So the real benefit of the alternate pickup locations for the carrier is having the ability to create synthetic delivery density. So they can convert those 10 single package residential stops into one 10 package commercial stop. And that's a huge um, benefit to the carriers for doing that, especially in the peak season time of the year when their networks are stretched very taut. All right, Dan, I feel like we've got a good big picture look at the motivators behind Pudo for today's retail environment and some of the impacts as well on the core players. But what I want to do now is use that to influence some advice for our audience and turn this into some actionable strategies. So I guess let's just ask the core question at a high level. What would you say are your core strategies for implementing a successful Pudo ecosystem, right? How do you uh, assess the various needs of the key players? What are some of the pitfalls you got to look out for? Walk us through your tried and true process here. So I think that the, the biggest challenge is faced by the host retailers, the, the people whose shops make up the Pudo network. They have the responsibility of managing the package inventory in the shop, of training their staff, and being able to provide a high quality customer experience when the e-commerce shopper comes in to pick up the package. And then that's really where position imaging comes in because our technology makes it much, much easier for the retailer to manage the package inventory in the shop and to locate the right package when the customer comes in so they can provide a quick and accurate handoff to the customers. The, the, the um, customer coming in to, to get their package does not want to stand in line and wait. They want to get in, get their shopping done, get their package and go. Um, if the packages are disorganized and it takes three or four minutes to locate the right package, that's not a good experience. Now, how do you begin to assess uh, the capacity 
of any given community's brick and mortar retailers to take on this package responsibility as well, right? Because so much of a successful Pudo launch uh, requires these brick and mortar locations to be ready for basically this, this new business model, this new workflow. How should any ecosystem even begin to weigh, can our brick and mortar locations in our community take this on? If, if you're referring to a retailer trying to decide whether or not they want to participate in a pickup and delivery option program, I think what they should do is take mm. a look at the kinds of technologies that are available for them to implement. Um, so they can, if they do that and they understand the, the way technology can be used to make the process easier for them, I think they'd be more interested in participating in the Pudo network. Um, if you're a smaller retailer, um, where everything is probably going to have to be manual, uh, you know, your resolve is going to have to be much greater. But um, using technology to simplify the process, to minimize the training that's required for the store staff, uh, and to make the transactions go quickly, I think that's the key. And what do you see as some of the potential pitfalls to launching a successful Pudo network, whether you're an e-commerce brand uh, or, you know, e-commerce platform looking to launch a network of your own or whether you're a, a, a retailer, a boutique or a, a department store looking to take on the logistics operations of it, right? Are there any core pitfalls that you often see that you recommend folks keep an eye out for and strategize against? Well, there are some challenges uh, from the retailer side in offering alternate delivery locations during the shopping session. So uh, all of the major carriers require the retailer to make a real-time call to um, a database to find out what access point locations or what PUDO locations are available near the consumer's home or near where the consumer wants to pick up the package. So there's a the technical challenge there. And having the bandwidth uh, and getting, the, getting that project prioritized for retailers can be a challenge. Actually, that's that's really what what we saw uh, during the time of COVID um, as, you know, there was, there was a lot of interest in uh, offering uh, alternate delivery locations during checkout, but because of COVID, all of the major retailers were scrambling to refine their BOPIS and curbside operations. And they were, there was no retailers who were able to implement the alternate delivery programs during those peak times of COVID. Now let's bring position imaging into the conversation to start to uh, close out this episode of the podcast. But yeah, how do you see this trend pushing for the adoption of other additional package management hardware, software, uh, or technology ecosystems of their own? Uh, and where does position imaging fit into that conversation? Well, I think the biggest challenge that uh, carriers face in managing a PUDO network is uh, churn among the host stores. Um, and the reason uh, locations leave the PUDO network is because they have difficulty managing the, the inventory or they get uh, negative feedback from customers who aren't happy with the experience they have when they get in the store. So our technology solves for both of those problems. Um, we can make it very easy to manage inventory in the shop, to make sure that packages that need to be returned to the carriers are done so in a timely manner. And we can make it easy for the shop staff to locate the correct package and complete the transaction with the consumer quickly and uh, uh, in a pleasant manner. And if you can do those things, you can keep shops in your network. And as a carrier, that's what you want because finding and replacing shops is a very expensive proposition. Would you say that uh, centering that technology investment and hardware or equipment investment and ecosystem is something that should be done early in the process and something that should be done as these networks are being conceived of? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think that would be the pre most preferred method. Um, unfortunately, when the large carriers in the U.S. started building out their networks, this technology wasn't widely available. Um, I think that the times are changing. I think that uh, our technology is going to be very well received in the market. 
And I look forward to talking to uh, the carriers and major retailers to show them how we can help them. All right, Dan, we're just about done with the conversation. Thank you so much for your insights so far. Last main question I've got for you is how you see Pudo fitting into a larger last mile standard for the whole logistics industry. And then your answer here, if you could kind of frame for us how UPS saw Pudo playing a part in its larger logistics network, being uh, you know, a leader in the industry, you know, to put it lightly, uh, and then use that to inform you know, a larger take here for um, other key players looking to launch Pudo. Sure, Dan. Um, well, UPS originally got into the Pudo network business to solve a specific problem with uh, undelivered residential packages. But after setting up the network, uh, UPS began to realize there were many different other use cases that they could, with which they could leverage that network. And one of the key things that came out of uh, some research uh, related to the network use was the sustainability play. So UPS has a, is facing challenges in major metro areas uh, where governments are becoming um, interested in reducing vehicle density in the city. For example, in the city of London, there's an additional fee you have to pay to enter the city with a, with a delivery vehicle. So using PUDO locations allows the carriers to um, get artificial density, delivery density, and to avoid uh, having too many stops in those super urban locations. It's been well documented now that uh, use of PUDO networks is reducing emissions around the globe, uh, fewer miles driven, fewer stops made, uh, less carbon dioxide emitted into the air. And then if you had to crystal ball for our audience a little bit, uh, you know, wh where do you see this fitting into a larger last mile standard or uh, some of the innovations around last mile delivery and last mile logistics uh, that are affecting the entire industry today? That's a really interesting question. Um, you know, and it, I've been thinking myself lately that um, what the industry needs is local consolidation of mm -hmm. all carrier volumes for final mile delivery. So in every town or county, you'd have one consolidation point where all the carriers would take their packages and then a smaller group of couriers would then perform the final mile deliveries to the PUDO networks. Um, I think this would be a great cost savings for consumers and for shippers. And uh, that would be my vision of the future, Dan. Exciting stuff. Well, this is clearly not the end of this conversation, but just the end of this podcast episode. So we hope to bring you back on to discuss more trends in PUDO as they're more widely adopted and we see a more successful ecosystems launched across the US. Uh, it might even be worth doing a compare and contrast with how uh, European nations have taken advantage of PUDO or PUDO-like networks for years now uh, to get a better sense for what could or couldn't work here in the States. But Till then, and uh, you know, I'll stop teasing future episode ideas for our audience here. We'll go ahead and wrap up the conversation. So, Dan, thank you so much for your perspectives today. Again, everyone, we've been speaking with Dan O'Connor, Vice President for the Pickup and Delivery Options Team at Position Imaging. And Dan, if folks want to find out more about some of your work in this space, or maybe they just want to learn a little bit more about uh, what role Position Imaging plays in this larger conversation around PUDO, how can they get in touch and how can they learn more? Well, the best way is to go to our website, which is www.position-imaging.com. There's a lot of good content uh, on that website, including you'll find a link to this podcast and um, uh, lots of uh, details about the technologies that we offer for the different uh, branches of our business. Fantastic. Dan, thank you again for your perspectives and your time today. And I'm looking forward to chatting again soon. Thanks again. Take care, Dan. And thank you, everyone, for listening to another episode of Intelligent Logistics, a position imaging podcast. If you like what you heard and saw today and you want some previous episodes or you want to make sure you're all tapped in on future content as we release more thought leadership from the larger logistics industry, make sure that you're subscribing on Apple Podcasts and Spotify 
and make sure that you're heading to our website, position-imaging.com. Again, position-imaging.com. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B, and we'll catch you on the next episode of Intelligent Logistics.